and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God also in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4.32 Dear Lord, we come before you seeking a heart of compassion and forgiveness. Help us to embody the kindness and mercy you so freely give. Guide us to forgive as we have been forgiven, to extend grace as we have received it, and to love others with the selfless love of Christ. In our words and actions, let us reflect your gentleness and patience, building bridges of understanding and peace. May our lives be a testament to your transformative power and endless love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for praying with me today. You're listening to The Jesus Podcast. Prepare yourself for a heart-wrenching story inspired by the parables of Jesus. Follow this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to. Doing so will keep you updated, but also help us get discovered by more people. We want the story of Jesus to be known throughout the world. Thanks for making that possible. Peter and Andrew bickered once again about greatness. The disciples often wondered who among them would be favored and become Jesus' right hand. The brothers bantered, argued, and shoved, as brothers tend to do. Finally, Peter raised his hands and stormed off. He sat down beside Jesus, who was sitting by himself on a solitary stone overlooking the water. Master, you've talked to us about forgiveness and showing mercy to those who have wronged us, but is there a limit? How many times should I forgive someone before they are undeserving? What do you think, Peter? Jesus replied softly. Peter groaned and looked back at his brother. He shook his head in frustration and said, The rabbis teach us three times is sufficient before wiping your hands of them. But in light of what you have taught us, I would say seven? That is a lot, Jesus said with a smirk. But I've called you to even more than that, Peter. Not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Peter laughed at the answer but paused when he saw Jesus' straight face. <laughs> oh, are you serious? Seventy-seven times? So, what you are saying is forgive them an endless amount, no matter what they have done? Jesus gestured for Andrew and the others to join them. He shifted his place on the stone and leaned over to them. Let me tell you a story about forgiveness. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle a debt with one of his servants. How important is it to forgive? How crucial is forgiveness for our faith and relationship with God? Welcome to the Jesus Podcast, dramatic retellings of gospel stories. I'm Zach from Pray.com, your host for this chilling parable. So how important is forgiveness? The shallow answer is pretty important. But what if I told you the answer to that question was pivotal for your faith and mine? The way we view forgiveness mirrors the way we view the gospel. Our understanding and practice of forgiveness is a direct reflection of our relationship with Jesus. Peter had a similar view to forgiveness as the rest of us, which is, okay, I know I need to forgive people, and as a follower of Jesus, I should probably be more forgiving than most, so I'll forgive someone seven times. But Jesus takes it a thousand steps further and says that we should forgive others 77 times. Basically, Jesus is saying you should never stop forgiving people. That's a radical statement because I'm sure you can think of one or two people in your life that don't deserve your forgiveness. They don't deserve any more chances. Jesus' words are counterintuitive to our human natures. That's why this parable of the unforgiving servant is so important. It has foundational truths for our walk with God and the way we interact with others. Let's not waste any more time. Let's dive into this parable told by Jesus. At the end, we'll unpack some hard but beautiful truths around forgiveness, mercy, and the meaning of grace. 
Let's go. The sound of chains grinding through the stone floor echoed through the halls. Eliev's feet were bound, and two guards held his arm. The men entered the great halls of the king, who sat on his throne by a flame of judgment. Eliav's bones shook as he was thrown to the floor before the king. The king's grand hall, resplendent with gold and marble, buzzed with hushed conversation among the nobles and courtiers, all draped in the finest of garments. The king sat upon his throne, figure of undeniable authority, his eyes fixed intently on Eliav. Your debt, Eliav, is as vast as the sea. The king intoned, his voice echoing off the grand walls. You have lost ten thousand talents in bad investments. Ten thousand! The king's declaration reverberated across the halls, shaking the ground. Everyone went silent, and all eyes were on Eliav. What have you to say for yourself? My my gracious king, I, I beg you, if I just had more time, I could recoup what I owe you. Please, just give me a month or two, and I... Time is not what you need, Eliav. What you need is judgment. The king's anger was boiling over. Eliav had borrowed more than he could repay, and now it was time to face the penalty. With knees trembling, Eliav collapsed to the floor, his voice a mere whisper as he begged. My lord, please grant me mercy. I implore you, be patient with me. Eliav's weeps filled the halls like a sad song. A hush descended upon the court. The king, known as a man of justice, regarded the trembling man before him. His brow was furrowed and everyone in the hall expected him to declare judgment over Eliav. Yet something unexpected happened. His eyes softened, and the king stood from his throne. He circled the fire, pondering for a long time. In his eyes glinted a spark of something different. In a turn of events that left the onlookers in shock, extended grace unforeseen. Rise, Eliav. Your debt is absolved. Leave now, and let this be a lesson to you. Eliav looked up, eyes red and swollen from tears. My my debt is absolved. I'm, I'm free to go. Yes. The king replied. My king, thank you. <laughs> I am forever grateful. This is a great kindness you've shown me. Enough, Eliav. You have received mercy. Now, depart from here. Eliav's chains were released, and he was escorted out of the palace. He was thrown out of the palace doors and tumbled into the dirt. The doors closed behind him with a decisive slam. Eliav looked up with awe at what had just happened. His face beamed with relief as he burst into an anxious laughter. He was sure that the king would throw him in prison, or worse. His mind raced with possibilities. Now that he was debt-free, he could live his life, make more investments, and maybe start a family. With glee and satisfaction, Eliav pranced back home. It was dark that night, and the clouds sank low into the city. Eliav leaned over his desk, cursing into the air. His joy from earlier was replaced with worry. Although my debt is paid, I still have nothing to my name! He angrily paced the room, wondering how he would get ahead. There are still men who owe me money. Those criminals haven't paid me back one cent of what they owe me. Eliav flipped over the table in anger, his chest puffed up and down with indignant rage. Who do they think they are? I help them with my hard-earned money, and they dare not pay me back? Eliav was consumed with indignation. He couldn't see the hypocrisy of his anger. Greed shouted his vision, and entitlement kept him from looking inward. With ignorant fury, Eliav stormed out of his house into the foggy streets. He marched a few blocks, the dim moonlight revealing his indignant scowl. He reached the home of another servant in the king's palace. Eliav pounded on the door and shouted, Joran! Open up! I know you're in there! Joran opened the door slowly, but Eliav burst through and took Joran by the collar. It's been months, and you haven't paid me back my silver! 
He struck Joran on the jaw and threw him against the wall. A hundred pieces, Joran! Where's my money? Eliev, please, have mercy. My wife and children are here. You should have thought of that before you decided to cheat me, Joran! Give me back what you owe! A hundred pieces of silver! Eliav pressed his thumbs against Joran's throat. A hundred pieces of silver! Please grant, please, please grant me mercy. I implore you, be patient with me. Joran begged, but Eliav gave no signs of relenting. I beg you, if I just had more time, I could recoup what I owe you, please. Just give me a month or two, and I... Time is not what you need, Joran. What you need is judgment. Eliav released his grip on Joran and stormed out of the room. He was blinded by darkness and consumed by greed. Eliav went to the town judge and pled his case against Joran. Within hours, guards stormed Joran's home and bound him in chains. Joran's wife and children screamed as their father was dragged through the dirt by two guards. The commotion caused a stir in the town. People peeked from their houses and watched Joran leave with tears sopping the floor behind him. Serves him right. The man was a thief. He'll be released when he can repay me what I'm owed. Eliev spat in Joran's direction. He was ignorant to the eyes of other servants on him. They had just watched Eliev beg for his life before the king earlier that day. The king forgave his debt of 10,000 talents, a debt so grand it would take a hundred lifetimes to recoup. Yet Eliev had Joran imprisoned for a few weeks' worth of wages. The sun had not yet risen, and Eliev was asleep under his blankets. Now you might be sitting here saying, Eliev, how do you sleep? Well, let me tell you, his conscience wasn't disturbed even a little after what he had done to Joran. He slept soundly, content with his own hypocrisy. Before the sun rose, Eliev was awakened by his door being broke down. Two of the palace guards burst through and seized him. What is the meaning of this? What have I done? Eliev screamed, but the guards didn't answer. They marched him through the palace doors and threw him onto the floor before the king. The king sat on his throne, fist clenched and jaw tightened in fury. Eliev gulped and began rambling. My king! My king! Is this about the debt that I owed? Thank you again for your mercy. I, I promise I will make wiser choices. In fact, I have a few ideas to make the palace much more money. Once I get some silver back, I can begin preparations for... Silence! The king interrupted with a booming voice. His rage was spilling over like molten lava. You wicked servant, he said, quivering with anger. He stepped down from his throne, looming over Eliev like a bird of prey. You bowed before me with a sea of debt that you could never hope to repay. It would have taken you a hundred lifetimes to make up what you owed me. With tears, you groveled here for mercy. Despite the mountain of judgment owed you, I cancelled all your debt. Yes, my king, and I am ever so grateful. Are you? The king shouted. His voice shook the earth. Then why didn't you show mercy to your fellow servant? He owed you far less than what you owed me. But you had him dragged to prison in front of his family. Eliev was speechless. He hadn't considered showing Joran mercy. The kindness of the king had not transformed Eliev's heart. Eliev tried to beg for forgiveness, but it was too late. You will receive the judgment due you and more. Take him out of my sight. Prison and torture for him until he has paid his debt in full. Eliev screamed as the guards struck him and dragged him away. The sounds of chains grinding against the stone floor echoed through the halls as he was taken to the dungeon, where he would spend the rest of his days. Jesus looked at Peter and then gestured to Andrew. 
The forgiveness you give to others should be in measure with the forgiveness that has been given to you. The fate of the servant is the fate of anyone who refuses to forgive his brother or sister in their heart. The disciples all looked at each other with remorse. They had bickered, held resentment, and allowed pettiness to divide them. Yet Jesus had called them to something greater. Forgiveness can be freely given when one has truly experienced the weight of forgiveness from God. Commentators put the worth of 10,000 talents in the ballpark of $12 million to $1 billion. So the punishment that was due to Eliab for losing such a sum of money wasn't exaggerated. A chasm of debt separated the servant and his master. It was irreconcilable. But in an absurd but beautiful act of mercy, the master forgives his servant. He forgives Eliab of all of his debt. What an insane gesture. What a dumbfounding and unprecedented act of forgiveness. I want you to imagine this happening today. You owe someone a billion dollars, which is just then wiped away. You're clean. You're free to go. No repercussions. Not even a mark on your credit score. This enormous amount of debt that was forgiven is a metaphor for the mercy God shows us. The sins we have committed against God and others have earned us a death sentence. Our sins have made us destined for death. But Jesus, who is rich in mercy and steadfast in love, forgave us. We have been offered redemption through the blood of Christ. He paid the penalty we are owned. You know, that's what it means to be redeemed, right? The penalty that we had to pay for our sins was death. But Jesus paid that penalty on our behalf. Our debt has been paid in full by the blood of Jesus. This parable communicates to us the incredible debt we've been forgiven. But this parable is also a warning. Eliav is understandably relieved that he's been forgiven. He goes home, but instead of letting his newfound freedom change his heart, he decides to go after a man who owes him money. We called this man Joran. Joran owed Eliav 100 denarii, which wasn't nothing. It was a considerable amount of money for a servant, around 100 days worth of wages. But think about what 100 denarii is compared to 10,000 talents. To give you an exact ratio, what Joran owed Eliav was about one six hundred thousandth of what Eliav owed the king. This is where the story takes a dark turn. This servant broke through the door and began choking his fellow servant for money. He violently lashed out at Joran because of what he owed, and then he had him dragged out and arrested for his debt in front of his family. Do you see the hypocrisy there? Forgiveness may have made Eliav feel better, but it clearly didn't have an effect on his heart or the way that he treated others. Here's the profound message for you and I. We have been forgiven much. Our master has wiped our tainted slate clean and replaced it with a new identity through grace and mercy. We have been forgiven a mountain of debt. We have been forgiven so much in our own lives. So, to withhold forgiveness, to gossip, and to continue in bitterness, it's not just bad for our hearts, but it works against the gospel of Jesus, and it proves that the forgiveness we've received has had no effect on our lives. We have been forgiven of much. The more we process that reality, the easier it becomes to forgive others. When I consider the mountain of debt that Christ has redeemed me from, how petty does my bitterness towards others seem? How small people's sins against me become when you stack it up against the mountain and lifetime of sin that we have brought before God. All that sin that was forgiven on the cross looks way dirtier and way messier than the petty sins that have been committed against us. Forgiveness is paramount to the believer, and forgiveness is an expression of our relationship with God, and it also reveals our understanding of mercy and grace in the first place. Matthew 5, 21-26 says this, You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable for judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable for judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable for counsel. Whoever says you fool will be liable for the hellfire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come back and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you were going with him to court 
lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and then you're put into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. In these words from Jesus, we learn three things about reconciliation and forgiveness. One, God cares deeply about the judgment we cast on others and the words we use to describe them. He says that those who call their brother or sister a fool are in danger of hellfire. He cares about how we treat others. We as believers are called to treat others with the same dignity, respect, and grace that Jesus has bestowed upon us. That's a high standard that we're not always going to meet, but may we always be striving after that, never feeling justified in treating someone poorly just because they've treated us poorly. The second thing we learn here is that God cares more about mended relationships than he does religious pursuits. Biblically speaking, I believe God would have any unresolved bitterness be cast aside before we continue to serve him at a high level. He said that even if you're going to worship and you have something unresolved with someone, go and settle it before you even enter into the presence of God. That's how much God cares about mended relationships. That's how much he cares about people finding reconciliation. The third thing we learn here from this passage is if we don't face people directly and swiftly, things will escalate past our ability to handle them. And not only that, but fostering unforgiveness also has a toxic effect in our hearts. Think about the people you've been bitter at for a very long time, the grudges you've kept, the forgiveness that you withheld. Has that been good for your heart or bad? Has that made your life any better? Has that made you a more joyful person? Or has it drug you down? Has it caused more hurt and harm to your life than it has thriving? Forgiveness is good for our hearts, but forgiveness is also important for salvation. Listen to these harsh, gut-punching words from Jesus in Matthew 6, 14-15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. What? If we withhold forgiveness, choose vengeance, gossip, bitterness like Eliath, we communicate that we really don't understand the gospel at all. When we withhold forgiveness from people, that means that we don't actually have a proper understanding of grace and mercy. So when you're asking God for mercy, when you're asking God for grace, what are you actually asking for? It's clear that if we're harboring unforgiveness and bitterness, we don't understand our own sin and the enormity of debt that we've been forgiven before God. Therefore, it's appropriate to question your relationship with God how you have truly been redeemed by him. Have you been harboring resentment and withholding forgiveness? Remember the unbound and endless forgiveness God has given you. Think of all the sins he's washed away. And listen, I know what you might be thinking. I've had people in my life that have hurt me egregiously. I don't want to just open the door to let them have free reign over my heart again. So what does forgiveness mean? Does forgiveness mean that I just forget what people have done to me and let them have full access to my life? Not necessarily, but forgiveness means you want for them what God wants for them, transformation, restoration, and salvation. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean you forget. It means you want for them what God wants for them, and that you will go to certain lengths to see that happen in their lives. Thanks for listening to the Jesus Podcast. If you want to support us and our mission to tell the story of Christ, go ahead and rate, review, and share this podcast. I can't wait to join you for this next episode. It's a famous passage about the farmer and the soils.